How was that? <laughs> it's good. Are you going to explain the reference to me? Because I've been away. Oh, I don't know you what's don't know. happening. I mean, take a look behind me if you're on YouTube right now. This is, you made the joke, I'm not in my studio right now. So Flo is, at least with Stephen Vogt, calls Esteban Florial. <laughs> And Flo you'll learn Flo more about Real. what he accomplished as we proceed. I can't wait. Well, should I explain why <laughs> I'm, I'm in this this situation here? I, I, can, I guess I can. I am currently out west, west of Ohio, certainly west of where the Guardians played today in Boston as well. I'm out in Arizona gearing up for a wedding later today. In fact, in a matter of hours. That's how committed I am to making this show happen. That as soon as we're done here, I've got to trim this thing up throw it up on the, the internet, both maybe f literally and figuratively, and then I got to go get my stuff on, get the kids ready, and get out the door for a wedding for my sister-in-law. So that's how committed I am. But I've been out of town since Saturday. I don't know anything that's happened. So how the heck am I going to do a show with you not knowing exactly what's happened with this baseball team? Because we're going to have fun learning your reactions to some things and some people who have contributed over the last couple of days. First of all, who gets married at what, what we're doing mi Monday weddings in mid April now. Oh, don't, I, I don't want to get in trouble. I don't know who's listening and who's watching. I, I don't want to get in trouble, but yes, we're doing a Monday wedding. We're also doing it at the grand Canyon. So <laughs> knock on wood, fingers crossed. I'm safe. The kids are safe. We're, we're going crazy out at the grand Canyon. So Monday wedding, I don't know. Does that have something to do with tax day? <laughs> Again, you're asking me questions. If the IRS I don't know the comes answers running, to. you have plenty of places to hide in the Grand Canyon. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I'm not going to try to guess. It's sort of like the theme of this show. I don't know what happened, but I am going to try to guess, and I'm going to have some reactions based on what you tell me. I do know the record. I do know that they're 11 and 5 as we record <laughs> this, so some good things had to have happened along the way, and I can't wait to hear from you and then my reactions as we all get in together and discuss this baseball team that's off to a pretty good start here. So the Yankees win the doubleheader Saturday. The first game was close. The second game was not. I don't even want to call it a reality check or a wake-up call or the Guardians finally played a good team and look what happened. Uh, but I thought it was important that they battled back Sunday and didn't look promising at first. Let's see your reaction to this. Aaron Judge launched a three-run homer to the bleachers off Logan Allen. Uh, I, I, can, I can kind of believe it. Yeah. Although usually the Guardians do a pretty good job against Judge. I feel like Yankees fans are at their maddest when the Guardians are containing Aaron Judge. <laughs> this isn't a real superstar. And I'm already seeing video clips about Juan Soto taking too many walks. Who could have predicted the Yankee fans are going to be upset about that? Okay, so I'm not, I'm not blown away by that. So continue. Cleveland fought back. Some shoddy Yankee defense helped. And then in a 4-4 game, bottom of the eighth inning, who steps up but Flo? Former team, homered against them the night before in a lopsided game. It didn't wow. matter. Florial hits one out again. So they take the lead 5-4. And before we... Was this like a, a wall scraper or was this, a, this an impressive shot? I don't think he does those. He's got when he swings, there's might behind it. And I'm curious what you think about him. Obviously, you didn't see the home run, but we've seen sort of everything that he has to offer a lot of swing and miss. Stephen Vogt lauded his swing decisions, and he's he's walked a little bit too, so that helps, but. You've seen everything. It's crazy. He's got a 123 WRC plus, but he's hitting 167 with a 286 on base. So it's he has been three true outcomes. It's been 29 plate appearances. But does he interest you at all? Does he interest you because of the other options? Have you seen enough? Where are you at? Well, I mean, homering in back to back days. I'm a little bit interested. Of course, for being a bit facetious, I know a little bit of what has happened. I didn't get to sit down and watch these games, but I've followed along 
to some degree and seeing who is, who's performed well, who's been struggling a little bit. We can get to the starting pitching. I want to get your take on that because you did see it live. Uh, starting pitching great today. Well, Xavier Curry, the MVP, backing it up back-to-back years, coming up in a big start against Boston. So I'm eager to, to get your take on that. But as far as Florial, I kind of come back to something I'm also feeling with Arias, and I have a feeling we're going to get to him as well. This is sort of the reverse of what we had talked about in spring training, where I said, what if, what if these guys that claim these spots, and in this case, we were talking about Arias, what if he claims this spot and he's okay, but somebody else is somewhere else, whether it's a triple A or limited at-bats at the major league level and is having a lot of success? At what point does Stephen Vogt decide, I'm going to give more playing time to the other guy? Now, I'm not sure if we're there yet. And Floreal hasn't done enough because, yeah, he's had back-to-back home runs. This team needs that sort of thing at the bottom of the lineup. You saw what it can do in a close game. Pinch it off the bench. Tremendous. Does he deserve more playing time? We'll see. I don't think we're there yet, but I'm, st- I'm still curious because I think this is going to play out. We're seeing it a little bit at shortstop. Arias has a couple of nice games here. J- certainly helped them win a game in Boston with the way that he played a home run short of of the cycle and just homered previously in the, the series against the Yankees. I don't know what you do. I'm not going to run away from Rokio five minutes into the season, but at the same time, Arias is saying, I, I should get in that lineup a little bit. Ride the hot hand. There's exactly. nobody. If we look at the outfield, there's nobody aside from Stephen Kwan who has shown whether just this year in a limited sample or even in the past that they are, without question, deserving of an extended look. So ride the hot hand. Will Brennan hit a pinch hit home run? Get him in the lineup tomorrow. Florial homered in back-to-back games? Let him play a third in a row. So I would do that. That's If anyone is going to seize an opportunity, it's going to be because they show you a little bit and so you want to see more. So you give them the chance to do that. If you, I think in the past... And there's risk of doing this now where you just fall into when you think I should play or try to divvy it up exactly evenly to give everyone a fair chance. But that doesn't always work. I mean, we saw like Freeman show glimpses last season, but he'd play once a week. You got to let guys try to get hot. And I think Vote's done a pretty good job of that so far. You know, that doesn't just like, just because it's a lefty, just because it's a right, like that doesn't necessarily have to mean like if a guy's hot, he's hot. And maybe a like Brennan facing a tough lefty is not an ideal matchup. Um, but it's not like there are really sexy options sort of forcing your hand here. Well, from afar watching it, I am so very impressed by all of the right buttons that Stephen Vogt has pressed here recently, especially these last two games. Now, the players make you look great. You go to a pinch hitter, he hits a home run. Good job, manager, but also good job to the player. Tito would say that all the time. You make a, a pitching change and the guy does his job, you look smart. If he gives up the home run, you look like an idiot. And so much of that is out of, the, out of his hands. But early on, it's not just the Brennan situation. It's not just the Floreal situation or how masterfully he's handled the bullpen. But again, that has to come back to those guys coming in and you're giving the opportunities to whether it's Heron and Sandlin today or some of the other, you know, Cade Smith, they have to perform well to make you look smart, but he's just sifted through this so magnificently. He looks like a veteran manager. He looks like he's done this so many times before. And you've said that about how he handles himself in a press conference, but I mean, just in terms of how he's divvied up the playing time, Gabriel Arias hasn't sat on the bench so much that he hasn't gotten a chance to get hot. He's played enough that he's gotten himself into a nice little rhythm. Whether it continues beyond Monday, I don't know. You don't know. Vote doesn't know. But he's at least put the players in a situation where it feels like nobody is off the radar yet. And I'm curious where they go as far as who takes more of the playing time as this season goes on. And and where's the line for him? We don't know that yet. But my goodness, Zach, how is he how has he handled this so magnificently to be able to weave everybody in and out? Everybody feels like they're they're contributing to these wins. Well, he's not f- far removed from playing. And as a guy who wasn't always an everyday player, I think he knows how much playing time he needed to stay sharp. And I think, and we've said this exiting last season, 
a fresh perspective on these players helps because it's a clean slate. Vote said it. I asked him about it a day ago. Um, and he said, I'm still learning these guys. I don't know what they're capable of. That helps everybody because he needs to see more. You can't have someone rot on the bench because vote has no idea if he's missing out on them. It's also funny. And it's a good reminder that we're nowhere near being able to draw conclusions on people because Gabriel Arias has a 159 WRC plus. Okay. He's hitting 308, 577. The wars, the wars are back. Yeah. <laughs> the wars are back. So two good days, whether it's him or Florial or, you know, you get a couple of walks that boosts your on-base percentage and your WRC plus skyrocket. Like the sample sizes are still tiny. And because they've divvied up the playing time um, and no one has gone cold on the bench, like, guys, I mean, Arias, it's 27 plate appearances. If he goes 0 for 8 the next two days, his numbers are going to look terrible. So we have to be patient. They have to be patient. The players can't be patient. I mean, you you can't, like, you have to, as long as you're doing what you should be doing and you're, they like to say quality at bats, even if the results aren't there, eventually they'll come. But you have to, you you want, you can't be doing this until like July. You have to get some answers at some point. So the players, it's on them to prove themselves and to, to for someone to take it and run with it. Because there are also people waiting at AAA who will eventually be ready for an opportunity too. Well, you said the players can't be patient. They can't, with their play, be patient. But I think mentally, they have to be patient. Look at uh, Tyler Freeman. You know, we've, we've given him lots of credit. I want to give him his flowers for the job he's done defensively in center field. But the numbers haven't been there. Partially fueled by some bad luck early. If you looked at just the process statistics below the surface, you would have saw, even as recently as a few days ago, a guy that was still doing things right still hitting the ball the way that he needed to to have success. He just wasn't having it. Lately, that's drifted here in the past couple of games. But again, that goes back to your point, what you're saying. You could be five days of having a great process, but three days of not, and all of a sudden the numbers have crumbled beneath you. That's why I'm not saying, well, Tyler Freeman had his shot. Rokio had his shot. Time to put both of those guys on the bench and, and go to Arias and Florial. I think that's, that's crazy talk to be having those conversations this early. So my point here isn't here that I have the answers. It's where is the line? At what point do we get to a point? And maybe it's just obvious. Maybe we'll know when it is that point. It's not there yet. And I, I, I want to give Freeman the opportunity to get his feet on the ground a little bit. I don't want him to be in a position where even if he's not having the success, that he's in panic mode knowing, looking over his shoulder, not that he's going to lose his big league spot, but he might lose his, his plate appearances if Floreal keeps hitting jacks at the right time or Brennan keeps showing up and hitting well-timed dingers or just introducing a little bit more power. Brennan's numbers aren't great overall either, but when you're talking about a couple of weeks into the season, one big outcome completely changes sometimes how you feel about a certain individual. So I don't, I don't know. I know you're not saying you know either. But it's just to me, as we're watching this manager go through this for the first time, yeah, he knows as a player what it feels like to get going. And I'm, I was impressed that you saw both of the, the names in the lineup today, Arias and, and Floriel. I, I love that. Keep those bats in the lineup after they have a good moment the day before. Let them try to build some momentum. Because you don't want, as a manager, you don't want to get in the way of that momentum being built. So I, I was so happy when I looked at that lineup card and saw both Floriel and Arias in that lineup. See if they can build on something. If they can't, then you will have removed you being the hurdle. That'll be because of them, not because of you. So Floriel hits a home run. Class A comes in for the save. Will Brennan takes a tough route to a line drive. Difficult to say what he could have done differently. Um, was the wind at play there? I know I'd seen some, it was very some comments on that. Yeah. It's one of those where it's just, I don't know, maybe I mean, could be on class A to just not give up such loud contact, I guess. Um, anyway, we go to extras. Yankees take a 7-5 lead. 
and threatening for more. Now, if I told you there was going to be a super impressive double play that would end the Yankees' rally, knowing who this team employs defensively, who would you guess would have been involved? Well, they've got a great defender at second base. Andre Semenes probably has to be involved. Rokio has made some spectacular plays already. Turned a, a tremendous double play earlier, uh, whatever point it, last week it was. I'm like you when you're out in spring training. I've lost any, <laughs> any semblance of what time is. But we've seen Rokio have tr- some tremendous defensive plays. Maybe not all the time, but some. Uh, Arias, when he's in there for Jose, I think he's certainly capable of, of having a, a, a great play at third base. At third base. So, I don't know. It, any of those feel like a, that would be a good starting point, I think. You know, the Captain Crunch Berries cereal with the oops all berries and everyone's made the jokes. Oops all shortstops. <laughs> yeah. But this time it's oops all catchers. <laughs> How about David what? Fry to Bo Naylor back to David Fry for your 3-2-3 three, three twin killing to end the inning, end the scoring threat, keep it a two-run game, and no one is prouder than Stephen Vogt, another former catcher, um, as Fry scooped up a, a chopper to him, threw it to the plate, Bo Naylor applies a tag, spins around, fires it back to first. Alex Verdugo might not have been hustling down the line to the best of his abilities, but what a key double play. Oh, what is this? Is this talking Yanks? What are we doing? <laughs> we throw it in under the bus. That's how that works. Okay, so from your perspective, do you think the fact that Fry also has to think like a catcher, not all the time, but has to, to me, you get a ball as a first baseman. I'm thinking as close to the bag as he was. Take the first out, and then you're going to try to grab that runner at the plate, right? Is it because he is thinking so far ahead that he's even before the play has started? I know they try to t- train everybody. From a young age, you're thinking, the ball's hit to you. You want to know where you're going to go with that ball. But for him to have the, the, the peace and presence of mind to catch it, but not go for the out and make a great throw. And also being a catcher, know where you want that ball. If you're going to receive the throw so you can make that tag and try to get the guy. But also, then the return throw to get it off as quick as that happened. Maybe this only happens if there are catchers involved because then on the the back end, you took another impressive scoop by Fry to complete it just like you would as a catcher trying to get a ball in the dirt. So that's been the plan all along, right? That's why you want so many catchers on the field. So they're always thinking, they're always smart. They're into every single play. Yeah, so Fry, credit to him for going back to first. Because there's no time right. to waste. Naylor's applying that tag, spinning, and he's not like surveying the scene. Oh, Verdugo's two thirds of the way down the line, so I'll just stick this in my pocket. It's that is instantaneous. Um, so I, it's impressive that Fry throws it to the plate and immediately thinks, "Let me get back over there." I do think there's something to be said about. I mean, you hear it all the time when everyone asks, why are catchers good managers? And it's your view of the field. You see every single thing that's happening. So your instincts have to be top-notch. I think that's what was at play there Um, on on both ends. You know, Naylor also, he can't, he also can't take time to say, hmm, is Fry close enough to the bag where he'll get, I mean, if you throw that down the right field line because the first baseman's not back in time, that's trouble. So... Just such a smart play. I I think that one of the things that's impressed me so much about um, this team so far is is defensively, I I feel like they're doing the right things. You're throwing to the right base. You're um, you're not making mistakes that are coming back. It hasn't been perfect. We've seen some poor routes or things like that in the outfield maybe um, or... Like the the Rokio throw that Jimenez couldn't corral, I think, in Minnesota. Um, it hasn't been perfect, but they they have done such a better job of capitalizing on their opponent's mistakes than vice versa. Um, so just a really smart play. Like they, they, it feels like they've been a really smart baseball team so far. And I, I, the Yankees, 
it seemed like they were constantly like bobbling the ball or not throwing to the right place or Glaber Torres threw one away that that fueled a, a Guardians rally. So just they haven't done that sort of thing. And anytime their opponent slips up, they've they've done a really good job. Yeah, and both Yankees and Red Sox, the last two games have had those those things happen. Of course, we give them lots of love. Jose, whether it's, you know, never stop running and forcing a throw and gets away, you create more runs that way. That's the way this team has to play offensively, but also catching the ball defensively, that also has to be the way that they're going to play. And you could know that and not execute it. So props to the coaches. I know they were giving uh, JT McGuire lots of love in the post game today for his positioning in, in the outfield. And of course, at, at Fenway, lot, you got lots of ball, got the right fielder tumbling and flipping and stealing home runs. That's just not your typical outfield. So anytime you got younger players out there, Quan removed from that. Hey, I want to make sure they're positioned, especially Tyler Freeman out there playing center field. Tough spot for him. So credit to the players, credit to the coaches as well for getting them prepared because this is the way they have to play if they're going to win. Yeah, um, I agree. That's They did play that well, way in 2022, so um, key to do that again. And another thing that has helped this team you think about the the last five games of that homestand, they fell behind in every one by at least three runs to start. A couple of them were 5 nothing, And they fought back. Two of them they pulled out. Um, so all in all, they've, they've shown some fight. I think a big, first of all, a big contributing factor to falling behind is the rotation has not been up to par. But let's focus on the bullpen. Because the bullpen has bought them time. It has allowed them, they've put up zeros so that the offense can come roaring back. And I'm going to list some relievers for you. I'm going to give you their stat lines for the season. And I want you to tell me your level of surprise just by the name and the numbers based on what you thought of them coming into the season. So let's start with Cade Smith, who didn't even know he was going to be on the roster until... The morning of opening day, playing cards with his siblings in his parents' hotel room in Oakland or San Francisco. And next thing you know, he's thrown nine scoreless innings, four hits, four walks, 13 strikeouts. Give me one through 10, your level of surprise by that performance. You know, I'm I'm not surprised. I think we all believe that there was at least a run like this in an arm like that. We had seen glimpses in spring training. You've been talking him up for, for a while now. I think the point in, of the calendar and where it's at, and he's having this amount of success early, maybe that's a little bit of a surprise. But I, I think I would rate it a little bit less than some of the other names you're going to get to. So I think I'll say like a six. I actually thought that this was, I thought he was capable of doing something like this. Yeah, he's got, I mean, he's got a really good arm. He had gaudy strikeout totals in AAA the last two years. If he got into trouble, it was, it was command. It was walks. And four and nine innings, you'd love that to come down a little bit. Again, it's early. Small sample. But to start your career like that, when it was expected that you were going to be a guy who bounced between AAA and the majors this year, that's that's a great start. Um I'd say surprising only because he's new at this, but there are other names on this list who I think uh, he's probably more surprised by. So let's move on to one of those. How about Tyler Beatty? He had not a lot of run in his first five appearances. Now he's three earned runs, five hits, four walks, and eight innings. So the ERA is 338. But that's... um, How about the fact that he's pitched the eighth inning? He's been the setup guy. He's right. pitched in long right. relief. He's kind of done it all. And again, a guy who made the team because other people were sick or injured. So what do you make of Tyler Beatty? I mean, the fact that he's already helped you win a couple of games is extremely surprising to me. So I'd put that at like an eight. That would probably be closer to perfect up near a 10 if he didn't run into some troubles in his most recent outings. Do you have some bad luck at one point in... That one of his outings, some of the runs. Now, if I, I was, I've been watching mostly through game day, so I, I can't watch the everything that's in happened. In play, runs. 
Exactly. <laughs> it looks like a rocket at the box score. No idea. But I'll say it's an eight. The fact that he's already come up big for you a couple of times, I never would have guessed that three weeks ago heading into the season that we were going to even see one game where he was going to help you win like that. How about Tim Heron? Two scoreless innings on Monday. One run on two hits in eight and two thirds this season. He's the only lefty in the pen. He had a pretty good handle. He was going to make it by, I mean, when Hentges went down, I would say. And it's gotten to the point where, again, Hentges is coming back soon. There will be some decisions to make. And he's put himself in a spot where it's really hard to to choose him as someone who needs to go down to AAA. Where do you put him, 1 through 10, in terms of surprise? I think I, I would put him at a 7. Uh, because we had seen glimpses, and we know he has the stuff, but sometimes, even last year, I think there were references of him just, uh, maybe not as far as to say he was pitching scared, but he was at least not letting the stuff just play in the middle of the zone the way that the coaches believe that he can. I think you've even brought up the fact that at times Carl Willis has said, just throw strikes because your stuff is electric. And he's such an interesting case where he can th- he can reach 95, 96, 97, but he doesn't always utilize that. It's a lot of breaking stuff. And I know that's probably his more lethal stuff and maybe the things he believes he has more um, more confidence in. But I think an arm like that that is building confidence, who I like that because he already has the stuff, but it's just a belief in yourself to know, even if I miss, if I'm trying to go like the, to the, hit the back leg on a slider or something like that, at breaking ball, and I miss my spot, I'm still good enough and my other stuff has set it up well enough but if I make a mistake, it's not going to be game over. And and so I'm excited because he's now he's gone from someone that's he's just keeping the spot warm to now you can trust this guy. Maybe not in the closest of all ball games, but you got some tough lefties coming up or a, a day like today where it's beneficial for your bullpen to not always have to run through all the same names every single time out. And I can hand him the ball and he's going to protect the lead, whether it's two runs or six. That's tremendous. So I'm I'm very pleased with what we've seen so far. A benefit of having that second capable lefty is if you get to a point where maybe your starter goes like five and two thirds, there's two outs, you're kind of in a jam. You don't want to go to Hentius yet because in a couple innings, there's going to be three lefties in a row who are tough. I mean, that Boston lineup is filled with lefties. Um, or So maybe you bring Hentius in, you bring one of them in to just shut the door that inning. And because it ends the inning, you don't have to bring them back the following inning with the three batter rule. So you can save the other lefty for the next time through the order. Something like that where, because right now, I mean, Heron pitched two innings because they have so many lefties and it made sense. But imagine if you had two lefties and you didn't have to go, you know, Barlow's not always the best option in the eighth inning or Beatty or whoever it is that you're planning that night. If you need a lefty, you can get through that lineup twice. And if, if Heron's pitching well, him and Hentges together, like that's two lefties with big breaking balls and 97-mile-an-hour yeah. heat. That's pretty fun. Like it. Like it a lot. It feels like Vote has a lot of ways to attack opposing teams right now coming out of the bullpen. Now, as we said, the credit goes to the pitchers because they're making that possible. But I love that in the Yankee game, he, he goes to Barlow, but probably matchup-wise, instead of a guy that's looking to – that's – trying to be around the zone and looking for some soft contact, he goes to power. He tries to get some swing and miss into the game going to Gattis. And so it's like, okay, again, to this part of the lineup, maybe I want the guy that's looking for a ground ball or some soft contact. He still can get some whiffs, but different style, I'm going to go to Gattis. Or I can go to Heron. Or I can go to Sandlin. I know I'm blowing through all the names that we're going to touch on here in a second. But it feels like not only is he interchanging these names any given day, but it's a lot of it feels like it's based on particular matchups and it's not just the lefty righty thing. That's obvious. It's well, this part of the lineup doesn't do good against a guy that can throw 98 or this part of the lineup. It'd be more beneficial to have someone that's living closer to 91, 92, but can soften the contact. You, you, there are so many different ways you can attack right now with a lot of names pitching extremely well. Yeah. I'm not going to include Sandlin in this just because he's been around. He's done this. We've seen him be really, really good. And he's been good. I mean, he's made one mistake this season. It was the home runs against Oswaldo Cabrera the other night. 
Um, sure. Can I can I mention one thing about him? I, yeah. I'm I'm interested in in his some of his pitch change usage over time. We you know when he first came up, it was a lot of four seam and the the two seam sinker. That's dipped really far down. Now he's introduced not introduced because he used to throw it before, but not as much. He's also now throwing the splitter a lot, which is an interesting pitch from a guy that throws from the side. I think splitter, you know, your your fingers are are split. That's the pitch over the top. Oh, that's why they call but, it that. Okay. But how from this? I know he's not totally submarine, but it is a side winding pitch that you throw as the splitter. I really want to dig into that data a little bit because there he's utilizing that more. And I'm curious, you know, just over time, is that something the coaches feel like, or he feels just com- more confidence in throwing that's going to make him better, get some more swing and miss because he's been really good here uh, for the majority of his outings. Yeah. A lot of guys throw it because it's kind of the antithesis to the slider where it's darting down the other way. BD, same thing. We've talked about that Bieber. But let's get to the last guy on my list because he's been the best. Hunter Gaddis, seven and two thirds innings, four hits, no runs, two walks, 11 strikeouts. And that tells part of the story. The fastball velo has jumped up from 93.4 to 96.5. I think we've seen him touch 99. The whiff rate on the slider has almost tripled from last season. And he's throwing it a little bit more often. He's reduced it from a five-pitch mix to a three-pitch mix. That changeup, you can see potential in it. Like It just falls off. And if he can tunnel that off the the fastball, he's going to be in good shape. It's early. These percentiles can change like crazy. But it's kind of fun when you look at Baseball Savant. You see that he's in the 94th percentile in whiff rate, 94th in strikeout rate. The walk rate's good. Missing barrels. Not giving up hard contact everything you'd want. So Hunter Gaddis has turned into a weapon. I I talked to him extensively last week and he said, he's loving the role. It's a blast. doesn't have to save anything in the tank. Knows he's only going to be out there for 15, 20 pitches and can unload everything he's got. And he's come in and he's kind of been that fireman. So what is your level of surprise? One to 10 on Mr. Gaddis. You see some guys that view the trip to the bullpen as a demotion. And in some cases, it is a demotion. But then you see the guys that seize it. And man, does it look like he's seizing it. Whether it's the stuff playing up or even just in... in he, like he's, It seems like he's dressing more and in, in, in trying to look more like the lethal reliever coming out in the eighth inning that's trying to just end somebody. Uh, and I love it. I think buy-in helps in that role. You have to have a little just a different mentality when you're a reliever. So as far as your question, how surprised I am by it, I I think I got to put it at like a a nine. Maybe like, as you looked through, I I looked at the numbers at the end of spring training and I thought those, the swing and miss stuff had some potential because there's not much in spring training I'm paying attention to, but if you're striking on a lot of guys and you're not walking them, that's a great starting place. That feels like some something that can carry over. Maybe not to the degree because of the, the level of hitters that you're facing, but if you're fooling guys, you're fooling guys. And and we saw the velocity uptick in spring training. So you were hopeful, but not to this level. I'm mean, Credit to some of our, our podcast listeners, some of our discorders that included this in their hot takes for 2024, that he would become the seventh and eighth inning bullpen weapon. They foresaw it. I'm not, I wasn't ready to go that far. I know you weren't ready to go that far. Oh my God, he's been a critical part of this bullpen so far. It's amazing what pitching with confidence can do. And when you know that you can just let it rip for a short stint and you're limiting which pitches you're using to the ones you're most confident in already, and they play off each other differently. You you, you aren't considering what might a curveball or a cutter do. You know, it's... When he was walking me through the inning he threw in Minnesota, and first of all, he's getting ahead of hitters. And when he's ahead in the count 0-1 and the hitter just saw a first pitch slider, think about all the different things he could do and all the things that the hitter has to think about. You're going to chase a changeup? You're going to wait for him to throw a 97-mile-an-hour fastball and then throw the changeup 
off of that and then you're probably going to chase it. I mean, it's just, it's just an interesting profile and it's cool when you see someone, I mean, like the way Tyler Freeman has embraced center field, he's having a blast. Like he, he'll go play infield if you need him to. He'd also probably love if he never played shortstop again and could just run in the outfield for the rest of eternity. He's having so much fun out there. It's cool to see guys, whether it's out of necessity or not, just take to a new task and thrive in it. And I think with Gaddis, like you have to enjoy that, don't you? Like if you're pouting, if you're pissed that you got moved to the bullpen, I don't know if it's going to work. Maybe you're, you'll be so mad you'll throw 99 miles an hour every pitch, but I don't know that you're going to be in the right mindset to to uh, succeed. <laughs> Coming up the next inning, churn off Antonetti and vote. I'm going to strike them all out. <laughs> really pissed off at those guys. Yeah, I think that's what, what I'm sort of talking about. When you have a guy that just embraces it, and the really good managers and coaches find a way to, to give the player, even if you're... You're taking them away from something they've done forever. Give them something they can take ownership of. And I love when the player runs with that. And for a while, I didn't know if, if Gabriel Arias would be capable of doing that. But it does feel like over time, he's... Okay, I'm not the starting shortstop right now, but where it is in the past, maybe that would have been a problem for him. He hasn't let, he hasn't let that stop him from helping the team, going and playing all these different positions and giving Vote the opportunity to move to third base, to first base, to right field in some of these games, and Fry going from catcher to first base to catcher to... I mean, that's that's incredible. And you, I think by giving the players something that they can take ownership of and say, okay, you're not the, the starting whatever, but in the case of Florio, guy, I need you. you. You are my saving grace coming off the bench right now. And we hope that this blossoms into more. But stay ready because you are my dude. Late in the game, I need a run. There's nobody on base. I am turning to you. Does it work all the time? Of course not. Of course it doesn't. But it's nice when you see that sort of thing happen where the coaches present the players with something and then they take it and they say, this role is mine. No one's taking that away from me. It maybe becomes more, but I'm going to be the best I can be in this given role. Can you spell Strizlecki? <laughs> I couldn't even say his name the last show we had. I, I, I was just like, you know, that dude they brought up. <laughs> well, he went back to that AAA guy. to clear a spot for Xavier Curry, who pitched brilliantly on Monday. Ben Lively will start Wednesday. Now, that's necessary because of the doubleheader, because of the rainout. So Carrasco will go Thursday on regular rest. Tristan McKenzie would presumably go Friday. But... You need a sixth guy in the rotation for one turn. I don't know what's going to happen after that. There are two questions here. One, who do you send down to make room for Lively? Oh, because oh, Sure, yeah, I'm going to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> there's nobody in the bullpen who is an obvious candidate. I mean, people are probably going to say Eli Morgan. I, I guess if you have to pick somebody, he might be the guy, but uh, I mean, he hasn't been terrible. And in a lot of bullpens, he wouldn't be the guy. Yeah. And then the question is, Lively Wednesday, Carrasco Thursday. Lively's out of options. Six guys in the rotation. Who's the odd man out? Right. Once you go to Lively, it, that's it. You're, he's here. There's no, no sending him elsewhere unless for some reason he's hurt or something like that. I, I don't know. And I think adding to the complication here is, I mean, everybody has been plagued by the walks to some degree. When Carrasco bobs and weaves his way through it, you go, hell of a job. That's amazing. You walked four or five guys. You've you still found a way to give us a chance to win. You are spectacular. But when I see Tristan McKenzie do that, I go, uh-oh. Carrasco doing that at his age... I'm not counting on you. I feel like everything you've given me is the, just a bonus. There's a reason why Tristan won that competition, that bracket, and you said he was the most important player. Well, he hasn't pitched like that so far. Um, and, and every outing, I'm finding something else that I'm a little 
I'm a little curious to see what happens next with it, whether it's the command, whether it's the velocity. I, I know you're not saying this. I'm not saying that that we've look what we're seeing here is just what he's going to be for the entire season. But right now, if it continues, what do you do with him? Because it, that's going to hurt you at some point. The bullpen's been fine to this point, but between Carrasco and what McKenzie's doing, and now you have Lively coming back, and you had Curry pitch amazingly on a, a pitch count in Boston to do that. It's tremendous. I don't know what you do. I really don't know what you do. Problem is you don't have anybody who can give you length. You know, Curry and Lively are coming off two start rehab assignments. Carrasco has... 12 and two-thirds innings and three starts. McKenzie is 13 innings and three starts. Bybee is 13 and two-thirds innings and three starts. Logan Allen's the only one averaging five innings to start. Yeah, Tristan's got 12 walks and five strikeouts. That's an alarming ratio. And he says he's healthy, no pain. He's not too concerned about the velocity. We've seen flashes of the, the 92 that you want to see at minimum. But it hasn't been consistent, and he hasn't pitched deep enough into it a game to prove that he can hold it. So, I don't know, because I, I don't think an IL stint does him any good. If you're feeling pain, if you're in discomfort, yeah. sure. But I don't think that's what this is. He, need, he needs reps. Yeah. That's what he needs more than anything else is reps. I mean, is is, is there a scenario where they could sell him? Go down to AAA and get your reps. I mean, he'll face the A's that this weekend. That f- That's the same thing, right? Oh, my goodness. I mean, that feels far-fetched. But there, this is kind of going back to the same thing we said about the position players. There is a line. We're not there yet. I don't think we're anywhere close to there yet. But there is a line where you have to ask yourself a really tough question. You have to make a tough decision. But no. Maybe Ben Lively comes up here and you see him a couple of times and he's getting knocked around and okay, well, I don't know. I'm not really concerned about that right now. But Curry, for Curry to come up and do that, I'll take that over a guy that comes up and walks five guys and I'm I'm dipping into my bullpen in the fourth inning. So I, I don't know. Like so many things, we don't have the answer because we're so new into this vote leadership and a little bit of an organizational transition. We don't know how they're going to react to everything. So I don't know where that line is with McKenzie, but there is going to be a line at some point. Yeah, and so theoretically, if you get live, you got Bybee Tuesday, Lively Wednesday, Carrasco Thursday. Those are those have been made public. McKenzie would be Friday with an extra day arrest. Logan Allen would be Saturday with an extra day arrest. Come back Curry Monday if you want. Um, but at some point, the six-man rotation thing can end and someone's got to go to the pen or away. And it'll be curious to see what they do. And and maybe there's a benefit to having whether it ends up being Carrasco or Curry or Lively in the bullpen because it's it's someone who can chew up innings. But I think the question, too, is who gives you the best chance to win in the rotation? Who do you want trying to pitch five or six innings? I don't know. Right. These are all the... We What's said... The- it's so funny that we were talking in spring training or even before spring training about the rotation has so much potential. You know, Gavin Williams, 200 strikeouts. Bieber, Cy Young, season back on track. McKenzie finally healthy. Bybee and Allen taking steps forward. And we said, how many starts... Do they need those five to combine for? And we could have framed it as how many innings? Because at the moment, all those guys who are the depth that you were scared of contributing too much or being leaned on too much, that's the whole rotation now, it seems like. It's, <laughs> I know. It's crazy how quickly this is. I don't want to say it's crumbled because it, I think the group's done a good job of holding its own. I mean, it's, it's also, let, let's not yeah. frame this as they're getting shelled and it's like, like I, Bybee, I'm not really worried about. I'm not really worried about Logan Allen. Um, Mackenzie, I am just because of the lost season and the uncertainty about because you were injured and didn't get surgery. Right. 
is that going to, are, are, can you be the same guy? Like, I don't, I don't know, but boy, <laughs> Gavin Williams threw a two inning sim game today. Uh, if I were the guardians, I'd be staring at my watch, counting down the minutes till he can come back. <laughs> yeah. Well, with McKenzie, it's not always, it's not also that you are trying to win games now. How do you position yourself to be the best you, team you can be right now? But because we know how important Tristan McKenzie is, that's not the only question in mind. It's how do you get McKenzie back to being McKenzie? And even if it's not Tristan McKenzie of 2022, how do I get Tristan McKenzie to be capable handing him the ball every fifth day, giving me a chance to win Tristan McKenzie? And it's not going to be from not giving him the reps. It's not going to be from running away from him. He also has to be able to pitch deep into games to get enough stamina in the arm to make it through the entire because it's not going to help him if he's getting removed in the you know three and a third innings every single start he needs to pitch deep so that he can build up the stamina that every pitcher does over the the course of the season so it's not an easy conversation thankfully the bullpen has been tremendous and that's helped lift it, for all of the shortcomings in the, the rotation not pitching like we think they're fully capable of to be at 11 and 5 having lost bieber McKenzie not pitching like McKenzie, Carrasco bobbing and weaving his way through outings. I mean, that's incredible. Usually this goes the other way. We're so used to them being like 23 and 27 in late May and trying to figure it out and thinking, <laughs> well, if they just get yeah. this fixed, I think they can play better. And now it's, I don't want to say you've stockpiled some house money, but you have gotten off to a good enough start where you bought yourself some time to figure some things out. And bought some self, bought yourself some time to learn about the position players who you're trying to learn about. Um, I think it, it it could be a lot worse. <laughs> I think it's is the way I would frame it. And I think a lot of that goes to the manager. I, I mean, I don't want to credit too much because it does boil down to the players, but it does seem like he's pulled the right levers. Um, yeah, so far, quite a bit, and I think it'll be something worth monitoring moving forward. You're going to make the right decisions in terms of who needs to pitch when, and we'll see what happens. But it's, I, I just, the impressive part to me is it, we just went through the relievers. If two of those four guys or throw Sandlin in, like if Cade Smith and Hunter Gaddis pitched the way you'd expect them to maybe for a rookie and a guy who was a failed starter, I don't think you're talking about 11 and 5. You know, the bullpen has done such a good job picking up the rotation that it buys the rotation time to get healthy. And the offense has done just enough to to keep them afloat. And a lot of times staying afloat is 500. In this case it's 11 and 5. Yeah, incredible. Taking a lot of it early adversity and people we didn't know how they were going to respond and gotten a lot of good good answers out of them so far. The hope is that as some of the guys that you do count on start to realize their actual levels, then the other guys drift off a little bit, and it all evens out, and you still continue to be a good a good team. But not a lot to complain about through an eleven and five start, I would say. You got any like Thursday morning weddings this week or anything? Or are we going to do a <laughs> Patreon episode later in the week? Oh, well, I'll be back Wednesday evening, so hopefully we're back to a normal-ish schedule coming up at, at Patreon. So I'm, I'm watching, as we wrap things up, I'm watching Cutter Crawford throw an abundance of cutters. I think, of course, that makes total sense. It's the opposite of Homer Bailey being a pitcher named Homer. How but about I, TJ Antone of, of the Reds just undergoing his third Tommy John surgery? Oh, my gosh. I mean, is that perfect or what? Uh, I, so far, I've avoided it. I, I was reminded of when we would play Hardball Dynasty, you would have in, the names are drawn from the baseball reference encyclopedia. So you get the normal names that you would consider, but there's also names that you would see back in 1897 thrown into the mix too. And you just get some really crazy named players, but you would also well, get let's guys give some that are examples. Named... Who were your favorite first names? Socks. Socks. Banana. Yeah. Socks is the first one. Banana. Yeah. You would always get the guy that was like Speedy Thompson, mm -hmm. and you'd go to his speed, and he would have a speed of five out of a hundred. <laughs> How is that possible? 
is there any any of those names you could think of off the top of your head or the total <laughs> total conundrum and how they arrived at that name given the skill set of this fake player no none of the names it was just there would be guys who would be a 99 in speed but their range would be like three how are you covering no ground when you're an Olympic sprinter? <laughs> oh, I mean, we've seen guys that are really quick but take terrible routes to the ball, right? True. I, guess, I, don't, I don't know. Well, thanks for making this work, dude. Don't fall in the Grand Canyon. I'm going go to go, go to the Grand Canyon now. Is the wedding, like, on a cliff? Yes. Cool on views. a cliff. Overlooking the Grand Canyon. Is that why they had to do it on a Monday afternoon so it wouldn't be crowded? 